know, in this segment of tithing, we're going to look into various different ways that the word tithe is used for throughout the Bible. When you're using a concordance, you can see how certain Hebrew words, when you look at the words that's within the scripture and you translate it into Hebrew from the Old Testament, of how they also mean tithe. And sometimes when you look inside the Orthodox Jewish Bible or the complete Jewish Bible, you see some of these Hebrew words used throughout the Old and New Testament, or either or some in the Old and some in the New. You know, some of the words are minka, teruma, terumot, which is like a derivative of teruma. Another word is neshek, first fruits, tithe, tenth, and omer. These are all different ways in which the word tithe can be used. Or when you're reading the scripture and the word offering is used and you, you look to see what that word offering means, it could mean some of these words as well. So it's very, very important that we just get out of the mindset that when we're looking to see about what the word has to say about tithe, that we just look at the word tithe in the Bible or tenth or tithing, because sometimes it goes far beyond that. Sometimes it's uh, known as the offering the Holy Service as well. So there's a lot of different variations of the word tithe, first fruits in particular, because in today's day and age, you know, with our economic structure, the way that we have it, you know that typically a lot of the economy of the world, they operate with their currencies, and it's very easy for us not to calculate of what a tithe could be. When we know that tithe is just 10%, and we also know that the money typically comes from making a, from trees. So again, it's still kind of like a first fruit of a tree and or a lot of the different metals that make up our coins come from you know the earth and the ground so still God in his wisdom even when he uses that vernacular from the Old Testament like first fruits of trees or first fruits of the ground it still makes sense even today because the money the currency that we use today and the uh, the metals that we use to make our coins comes from the ground or comes from the trees so God is very very smart and he's wise and, and we can still see the principles, we're going to look holistically of how these words are used throughout the scriptures and to give us a better understanding of that the tithing aspect is not just a principle of law, but it's a principle of the life of a believer who is righteous in Christ to give an offering in righteousness so that you can be blessed and so that you can bless the foreigner, the uh, widower, the, the orphan, the child, the believer, the unbeliever that comes in the midst of of your congregation, in addition to also make sure that we're encouraged and edified so that we can go ahead and deal with the upcoming week with our respective jobs or, or with our respective responsibilities. Again, going back to the story of Abram and Melchizedek, we see in Genesis chapter 14, that word uh, tenth that's used there, the Hebrew word is asar, which is to accumulate, and that's uh, the primitive root word of asar is ashar, which means to accumulate, to make rich, to make wealthy. So God has put into that word when we actually give, when you are a giver and giving the tithe, God will bless you. Not just with finances, but God said he will open up windows, plural of heaven, and pour out a blessing, singular. What that blessing is, I believe it's all encompassing that everything that pertains to life and godliness, God can touch your life in that facet when you decide to be in covenant with him and to honor him by giving your first fruits, your first tenth of your income so that you can be blessed so that you can honor God, so you can show that you trust God, that you depend on God, and, and in turn, use that to bless your, the local under-shepherds in your church, and so you can go ahead and evangelize whoever God has called you to evangelize, and most importantly, encourage the body of believers that are within your midst and your sphere of influence. And we see in Genesis also, Genesis chapter 28, when Jacob makes a vow unto the Lord and says that if God will do these things, that he will give a tenth unto the Lord. And again, we don't actually see this fulfilled until about Genesis chapter 35. And he gives a drink offering unto the Lord at the house of the Lord called Bethel. And he gives a drink offering. The Hebrew root there is neshek, which means like an oblation, you know, a tribute, but typically deals with like a liquid drink offering that you're making unto a God. But obviously he's making unto the God. And I believe this offering that he made was a tenth because it's in reference to God actually showing up the way that he said he would in Genesis chapter 28. And he reveals himself again in Genesis chapter 35. And Jacob is moved to give God a tithe. And we'll see how in this tithe study of how God wants to receive tithe of new wine, of oil, and of grain, 
and how that was used to actually bless the priest, not only bless the priest, but the priest was able to take care of their families. Not only that, but they were also able to maintain the house of the Lord too, which is very, very, very important. Let's look at the Hebrew word minka. It means to bestow a donation, to give a tribute, a sacrificial gift, an oblation. Typically when you're donating, you're giving to a good cause. You know, an example is charity. But we know that what we're giving unto the Lord and to our local churches, that's not just charity. We're doing, we're helping to equip the body of believers and we're helping to push forward the work of the Lord and the preach word of Christ so that lives can be changed. In addition to that, the Hebrew word teruma means a sacrifice or a tribute as well. And tribute has the mindset of giving a gift that shows gratitude, respect, and admiration. And we see this tone, we see this sense in Genesis chapter 28, verse 22 in the Amplified, because it says, This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, monument, memorial, will be God's house, a sacred place to me. And of everything that you give me, I will give the tenth to you as an offering to signify my gratitude, dependence on you. See, the Amplified brings out the Torah meaning in the aspect of showing the fact of gratitude and dependence on the Lord. In Nehemiah chapter 10, we're going to see certain aspects of the scripture that talk about the first fruits of dough, of wine, and oil, and how they were for the priests and their portion. And we're going to see other aspects of scripture as well that lets us know the duties of the priests and how the priests were supposed to be taken care of by the tithe of the Israelites and how when they received the tithe of the Israelites, they themselves, the high priests, were supposed to tithe unto the Lord also. So God has an order of things. And now as Jesus being our high priest living on the inside of us, we are still supposed to be moved to bless the priests that are in our midst. Because every believer who was born again in Christ is a priest, whether male or female. You know, we're one new man in Christ Jesus. The wall between Jew and Gentile has been broken down. And God through his spirit has created one new man, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. And the tithe helps to establish his God order. Not only that, but it helps to bless his body and to propagate his word. In Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 34 to 39, it says, We have also cast lots the priests, the Levites, the people for contributing the supply of wood to bring it to the house of our God, according to our father's household at set times annually, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. Verse 35, And we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree to the house of the Lord annually as well as the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law and the firstborn of our herds and the flocks to bring to the house of our God. For the priests who minister in the house of our God, verse 37, we will bring the first and best of our dough and contributions, the fruit of every tree, the new wine and the olive oil to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God and the tithe of our ground to the Levites. For the Levites are the ones who receive the tithe in all the rural towns. The priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites, when they receive tithes, and they shall bring forth one-tenth of the tithes up to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the Israelites and the sons of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers, the utensils of their sanctuary. The priests who are ministering, the gatekeepers, and the singers are there. In this manner, we will not neglect the house of our God. We see here God has set up his system of first fruits, which is a tithe, so that the priests can be blessed. Not only that, so that the gatekeepers the musicians and the workers of the church could be of the synagogue at that time could be blessed. And the synagogue is a old foreshadow of what our local churches look like. And that I believe is the model that certain local churches have been using in the current body of Christ to actually have a local, you know, brick and mortar building where people can come congregate to hear the word of God and be changed by the word of God, both believers and unbelievers alike. So we see here how God has a system so that the local under shepherd, the main high priest that God has established as the pastor over that congregation or the priest over that congregation. In addition to that, every worker, when you are born again, you are a priest. So again, the gatekeepers today, the singers, the worship leaders, the ones who go out, the Levites who go out and collect the tithe, these are people who are still priests who are born again and they are taken care of by the tithe. And God wants us to give so that so the system can continually go on so that the people of God can be blessed. And so God, people will not go without, and people do not have to go and get two or three jobs, because we're going to see in the aspect of the story later on in our studies of how when the house of God was neglected, how the priests have to go have to go back into the field and, and find their jobs and work. 
And again, some people may be moved by the Lord to have this as their portion where they actually work, but they're not living full time off the gospel. But you cannot make that for everybody. Certain people, they want to stay in the word, learn the word, and feed the people of God, and they want to live off the word. If that's their belief system in regards to how God is leading them, we have to make sure that we're supplying them. And for those people who do not want to flow in that, like the Apostle Paul, him himself, he worked and he didn't live fully off the gospel or fully off the offerings that were given to him. He used it, I believe, from time to time to deal with certain expenses and to help with travel and things of that nature, but he didn't live off it and get paid off it. Him and Barnabas, they had jobs where they were also, you know, that money was helping to take care of their livelihood and not just fully off the gospel. But again, the God system is for the ones who want to minister fully off the gospel to be lived off the gospel, if that's how God moves you. In verse 39, the word offering used is teruma. In addition, notice how the word says the Israelites and the sons of Levi will bring the offering and not an offering. The offering of the Lord that had to be received so that God could be honored, so God could be worshipped. This offering is holy and set aside. And we'll see in Exodus chapter 29 uh, how in the ordination of the Aaron and his sons, which Aaron was the first high priest according to the law, how the thigh of the ram was used as the priest's portion. And this was a continual offering that was set aside for Aaron and his sons forever from the Israelites. So in today's vernacular, we can say that the portion set aside to every high priest of every church across the globe, as long as God moves you in this realm is for you to be taken care of from the the ram or the tithe that is set aside as your portion. And this is to take care of the high priest. And in that day and age, you know, the high priest had to come from the lineage of Levi and of Aaron, obviously. So today we are all priests by the spirit of God in Christ Jesus. So anybody who is a born again believer could be a priest as long as God is calling you to that office to actually be the pastor or an overseer over a group of believers. If God is not calling you to do that, but you still are responsible as a priest to go into your respective sphere of influences, wherever God has called you, job-wise, occupation-wise, or if you're just a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, to make an impact for your kids, for your around your employees, if you're a student, of your other classmates, the other students, to make an impact through the glory of God, through how you live, and as the Lord leads to when it's time for you to speak up about the Lord Jesus Christ or the things of God, to be bold and to be clear about who God is, what he stands for, and most importantly, to show the love and speak on the love of God and how he loves the unbelieving world so much so that he sent Jesus to die for them while they were yet sinners so they can be reconciled back to God in Jesus' name. In Exodus chapter 29, verse 22 to 46, Amplified, we can see again some of the principles of the Lord of during this ordination of Aaron and his sons of the portion that was set aside for them to partake of to take care of their family and themselves. Verse 22, you shall also take the fat of the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the intestines, the lobe of the liver, the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination, and one loaf of bread, and one cake of of oil bread and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. You should put all these things in the hands of Aaron and his son and wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then you shall take them from their hands, add them to the burnt offering, and burn them on the altar for a sweet and soothing aroma before the Lord. It is an offering by fire to the Lord. Then you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's ordination and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your Moses' portion. You shall consecrate the wave breast offering of the ram used in the ordination, a wave thigh offering of the priest portion, since it is a contribution for Aaron and his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons as their due portion from the Israelites forever. So the priests are supposed to be taken care of by their due portion of the offering, which is their the tithe, which is the, the first sling of the ram is, is one aspect forever. Continue with verse 28. It shall be a heave offering to the Lord from the Israelites, from the sacrifices of their peace offerings. The holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him, to be anointed and ordained in them. That son who is high priest in his place shall put 
them on each day for seven days when he comes into the tent of the meeting, which is the tabernacle, prior to the actual building of the tabernacle when it was actually just a tent to minister in the holy place. Verse 31, you shall take the ram of the ordination and boil its meat in a holy place. Aaron and his son shall eat the meat of the ram and the bread in the basket at the doorway of the tent of meeting. They shall eat those things by which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration. But a layman shall not eat them, because they are holy that is set apart to worship of God. And if any of the meat of ordination or the bread remains till morning, you shall burn it in the fire. It shall not be eaten, because it is holy. So you shall do to Aaron and to his sons in accordance with what I have commanded you. During seven days you are to ordain them. You shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. You shall cleanse the altar from sin. And when you make atonement for it, you shall anoint it to consecrate it for God's sacred purpose. For seven days you shall make atonement for the altar of burnt offering and a consecrated, and then the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar must be wholly set apart for thy service. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two one-year-old lambs shall be offered each day continuously. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb at twilight. And with one lamb there will be one-tenth of a measure of fine flour mixed with one-fourth of hin of beaten olive oil, one-fourth of hin of wine for a drink offering to be poured out. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight to do with it as with the grain offering of the morning and with the drink offering for a sweet and soothing aroma to appease God and offering by fire to the Lord. This will be your continual burnt offering throughout your generation at the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak with you there. There I will meet with the Israelites and the tent of meeting shall be sanctified by my glory, the Shekinah, God's dwelling presence. I will sanctify the tent of meeting and the altar of burnt offering. Also, I will sanctify Aaron and his sons to serve as priests to me. I will dwell among the sons of the Israel and be their God. They shall know from personal experience and acknowledge that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt so that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. In verse 41, the first time the word offering is used is the Hebrew word minka. In verse 41, the second time the word offering is used is the Hebrew word neshek, same word used during Jacob's drink offering of his tithe in Genesis chapter 35, verse 14 to 15. The grain and drink offerings were offered up to God in similar fashion as the burnt offerings. We see here in this during this ordination service, the burnt offering was also part of their continual share, but that was not the same thing as the tithe. We see there was a portion again during the consecration where they received the thigh from the ordination and also the heart, and that was supposed to be their portion as far as like their perpetual share. And you will see in other scriptures where this will be illuminated even more so when we see additional details of how, what they were supposed to receive as tithes and what the Israelites today, which would represent the body of believers, the, the Messianic believers of today would bring to their local churches so that they will be blessed and so that their priests would be taken care of so the house of God would not be neglected. And if that particular pastor did not want to go get additional job or additional job, they, they wouldn't have to. As in Aaron and his son's ordination in Exodus chapter 29, verses 26 to 32, there's a part of the ceremony where they eat their share. And we will see a correlation in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 14 to 18, of how God gives the grain offering. The grain offering is a picture of the tithe. He gives the grain offering equal holiness to the guilt and the sin offering. And we'll see this depicted in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 14 to 18. It says, now this is the law of the grain offering. This is the tithe. The sons of Aaron shall present it before the Lord in front of the altar. One of them shall take up 
from it a handful of the fine flour of the grain offering with its oil and all the incense that is on the grain offering, and he shall offer it up in smoke on the altar, a sweet and soothing aroma as a memorial offering it to the Lord. What is left of it, Aaron and his sons are to eat. It shall be eaten as unleavened bread in a holy place. They are to eat it in the courtyard of the tent of meeting, which is the church. It shall not be baked with leaven, which represents corruption or sin. I have given it as their share of my offerings by fire. It is most holy, the grain offering. Listen to this, it is most holy like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among the sons of Aaron may eat it as a share. It is a permanent ordinance throughout your generations from offerings by fire to the Lord. Whatever touches them will become consecrated, ceremonially clean. How is the picture of today's modern day priests, people who are born again, who have been called to the office of overseeing or being a, a local under shepherd of their flock? How is this seen when we as believers bring the tithe into the storehouse? The priest is able to then take that tithe and use it for themselves to go into the marketplace and buy whatever they may need for themselves and for their families, whether it's clothes, whether it's uh, food, or whether it's uh, things that pertain to enjoyment or extra resources for themselves to learn and grow in the Lord. And not only that, they're supposed to take that money and use it in the church so the church can be equipped to hire people in their respective different offices so that it can help the church expand and most importantly spread the message of the lord jesus christ within their local body through different various ministries and also through other missions to the poor in their local communities to the poor across the world that's what the, the tithe is used for and a lot of times churches are not able to do what they need to do because people are not faithful in giving god's required righteous offering of the tithe consistently and they look at it as, oh, you know, I don't feel like it, or I'm not moved to do that, or I believe it's Old Testament law. No. It was a picture prior to the law, like I said, we already went over it with Jacob and with Abram, with Melchizedek, and we're going to go over it again in Exodus chapter 16. That was also prior to the law of how God, when he rained down manna from heaven, he would require them to receive according to the number of people that were within their family, within their tent. And that the measurement that God used to allow them to receive the manna was an omer, which was a tenth of an FF. An FF is a bushel which could be a grain offering. So they were able to receive a tenth of the grain offering of the manna that was laid down from God supernaturally, and God didn't want them to get any more than a tenth for each person that was within their tent. So if it was a family of five, it was a tenth for each person. If it was a family of three, a tenth for each person. So God in his wisdom was able to, during even his supernatural supply, he could have made it so that they could just eat as much as they wanted as far as allowing it not to rot the day after. But God wanted to give them, even under this covenant of grace, because this was still prior to the law, they were only able to receive a tenth of the bread that was laid out for them to come get according to the number of people that were within their family under the, their tents of where they were staying. So God, again, still uses the picture of the tent in this scenario, and he requires Aaron to put in a tent of the bread inside of a basket and to put inside the Ark of the Covenant to be a perpetual share. Again, this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ is a perfect picture of the Ark of the Covenant where the mercy seat has been established with his blood and so that we're not able to be cursed but we are able to be blessed through the spirit of christ changing so that we can walk in the fruit of the spirit so that we can be the moms the dads that god has called us to be so we can be the uh the men and women of god that god is calling us to be so we can be the servants of the lord that god is calling us to be in christ jesus amen in number chapter 18 we can see the responsibilities of the priests and the levites it says the Lord said to Aaron, you, your sons, and your family are to bear the responsibility for offenses connected with the sanctuary, and you and your sons alone are to bear the responsibility for offenses connected with the priesthood. Bring your fellow Levites from your ancestral tribe to join you and assist you when you and your sons minister before the tent of the covenant law. They are to be responsible to you and are to perform all the duties of the tent, but they must not go near the furnishings of the sanctuary of the altar, otherwise they both and you will die. So. There were certain people who were called not to go into the Holy of Holies, or we would say in this position, not to be the head pastor over the local body, but they were to help that pastor 
as that pastor proclaimed the finished work of the Lord in today's modern day. It doesn't mean that the Levites could not be preached, or in today's vernacular, it doesn't mean that a person who is a believer cannot preach, but you have to be called. You cannot just place yourself in that position, and you should also make sure that you are talking with other mentors who see the calling of God in your life and who see the gifting of you proclaiming the gospel message in front of a local body or a congregation, or if you are a traveling evangelist. Verse 4, there are to join you and are to be responsible for the care of the tent of meeting, all the work of the tent, and no one else may come near where you are. It's very, very important, side note again, it's very, very important that we just don't put anybody up there to just go and just think just because they have a, a gifting that God has called them to preach in front of the local body. If God is not calling them, and if there's not confirmation, then it could be of detriment to that person, to the, the head pastor, and to the local body. So we have to make sure that we operate out of order and being led by the Spirit of God. Verse 5, you are to be responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the altar so that my wrath will not fall on the Israelites again. I myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you, dedicated to the Lord, to do the work of the tent of the meeting. But only you and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain, which is the Holy of Holies. I'm giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary is to be put to death. Then the Lord said to Aaron, I myself have put you in charge of the offerings presented to me. All the holy offerings the Israelites give me, I give to you and your sons as of your portion, your perpetual share. You are to have the part of the most holy offerings. Certain translations for like King James Version, they use meat offerings that is kept from the fire. From all the gifts they bring me as most holy offerings, whether grain or sin or guilt, that part belongs to you and your sons. Eat it as something most holy. Every male shall eat it. You must regard it as holy. This also is yours. Whatever is set aside from the gifts of all the wave offerings of the Israelites, I give this to you and your sons and your daughters as your perpetual share. Everyone in your household who is ceremonially clean may eat it. I give you all the finest olive oil and all the finest new wine and grain they give the Lord as the first fruits of their harvest. All the land's first fruits that they bring to the Lord will be yours. Everyone in your household who is ceremonially clean may eat it. Everything in Israel that is devoted to the Lord is yours. The first offering of every womb, both human and animal, that is offered to the Lord is yours. But so you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. When they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five sh shekels of silver, according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 garage. But you must not redeem the firstborn of a cow, sheep, or goat. They are holy. Splash their blood against the altar and burn their fat as a food offering and aroma pleasing to the Lord. Their meat is to be yours, just as the breast of the wave offering and the right thigh are yours. See, the breast and the right thigh was typically what was set aside as the tithe unto the, the priest. Whatever is set aside from the holy offerings the Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you and your sons and daughters as your professional share. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for both you and your offspring. The Lord said to Aaron, you will have no inheritance in the land, nor will you have any share among them. I am your share and your inheritance among the Israelites. We'll see here that God didn't allot certain cities to stay for at this juncture, but later on we'll see a certain uh, portion of scripture where God uh, allows them to have certain cities that are close to the temple and synagogues for them and their families to stay. As I'm talking about the priests here. Verse 21, I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of the meeting. So the workers who help the priests, the high priests, also get a share of the tithe too. Verse 22, from now on the Israelites must not go near the tent of meeting or they will bear the consequences of the sin and die. It is the Levites who are to work at the tent of meeting and bear the responsibility for any offense that they commit against it. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. They will receive no inheritance among the Israelites. Instead, I give to the Levites as their inheritance their tithes that the Israelites present as an offering to the Lord. This is why I said concerning them. They will have no inheritance among the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Levites and say to them, When you receive from the Israelites the tithe they give to you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as the Lord's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to you as grain from the threshing floor or the juice from the wine press. In this way, you will also present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites. From these tithes, you must give the Lord's portion to Aaron the priest. Verse 29. You must 
present as the Lord's portion the best and holiest of everything given to you. Say to the Levites, when you present the best part, it will be reckoned to you as the product of the threshing floor of the winepress. You and your household may eat the rest of it anywhere, for it is your wages for your work at the tent of meeting. By presenting the best part of it, you will not be guilty in this matter. Then you will not defile the holy offerings of the Israelites, and you will not die. In verse 8, notice how the offerings are holy offerings, and they're used for the high priest and Aaron as a professional share, the same function as the tithe. In verse 8, the word offering used is teruma. In verse 9, the word offering used is minka. In verse 19, the word offering used is teruma. In verse 24, the word offering used is teruma. In this particular scripture, the word tithe is used in this verse as well. In verse 26, the word offering used is teruma, and the word tithe is also used as well. In verse 27 and 28, the word offering used is teruma. And in verse 28, the tithe is used in the same verse. In verse 29, the Lord's portion, we see how similar to the word first fruit, the word best or choices is chaleb, and it means fat, the richest or choice part, and this is, again, significant of the first fruit. And in verse 31, we see the word wages is a reward in the King James Version. The Hebrew word here for wages in verse 31 is sakar, which means a payment of contract concretely, a salary, fair maintenance by implication, compensation, benefit, higher price, reward, wages, or worth. So we see here God's system that he has set for the Levites and also for the high priests who are to work and take the offenses of themselves and of the people of Israel, the Israelites, and also for the Levites when they present the sin offering and the guilt offering in the Holy of Holies, and only the high priests were able to go in there. Again, there's a distinction in regards to where God has called you. If God has not called you to be the main pastor of that church. You are probably just called to maybe just help along to facilitate the, the structure and the different types of things that God has called that local pastor to do within that local body and within that local community, and we should help that. One way that we as believers can help is just making sure that we are consistently bringing our tithe of our gross income to the house of the Lord so that the house of the Lord can be blessed so that God can open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing not only upon you but upon your local body and bless the continual flow of the preached word of Christ that is coming forth from that pulpit that people can be impacted and changed. <music>